pockets. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm back. Welcome to DTLT Today. I'm Jim Groom, and with us today we have one of UMW's finest, Professor James Harding, who's actually a professor in the English Linguistics and Communication Department, and his specialty is avant-garde theater. And uh, James, I asked him to come on the show today because you teach a seminar that you've been teaching for almost a decade now, mm -hmm. which is um, basically the title of the seminar, I think, is 9-11. Stages in context of 9-11. Okay. So thank you for <laughs> pointing that out. Yeah. So let me ask you, 10 years on, we're looking back on 9-11, and I think you know, we're trying to make sense of it. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your seminar, a little bit about what this might mean? maybe the tenth time you've taught it or thereabouts? It's not the tenth time I've taught it, but, uh, but the course has evolved over, uh, uh, over the decade for a variety of reasons, um, one of which is that uh, when I started teaching it, uh, freshman seminar didn't exist. Yeah. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, and as I first started teaching it, I started teaching it in our global uh, issues and literature courses. And because it was a global issue. Sure. And, uh, uh, and then when we moved towards the freshman seminar, I thought that this was a great opportunity to, you know, shift material uh, into a context that would immediately appeal to a much larger cross-section of students uh, um, because from almost any angle, this is an interdisciplinary course. I mean, it's not just a course about theater, uh, even though it's called Stages in Context of 9-11. Uh, um, the stages clearly uh, refers to the theater itself. The context uh, refers to history, political thought, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and all sorts of other, you know, kind of cultural issues sure. that, uh, um, that uh, emerge and or uh, are a part of um, the, uh, the events of 9-11. And, uh, uh, and so the course has always been evolving just in terms of the practical dimensions of how courses are offered at Mary Washington, but the course has also been evolving because in, uh, uh, in the decade that has passed, more and more material uh, has come out dealing with the wow. events of 9-11. And the events of 9-11 are also related to the wars in Iraq and the wars in Afghanistan. And, uh, and there's a, a pretty significant response from the theatrical community uh, um, to those wars. And, uh, and uh, you know, I don't think anybody has to make the ca case that those two wars are connected with the events of 9-11. Sure. I mean, and, uh, uh, but, uh, but how the theater responds to them uh, is uh, uh, is pretty fascinating to observe as well. Now, when we were talking earlier this week, you were saying you lay the framework for your students when you start it, kind of problematizing or interrogating this idea of terrorism post 9/11. Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I think it's the State Department's definition of terrorism. Well, I mean, you know, what's really kind of interesting is, uh, uh, I mean, we've read a number of different articles that uh, uh, um, that deal with uh, um, the the very elusiveness of the term terrorism, sure. how difficult it is to define. Um, one of the undersecretaries of state when uh, Colin Powell was secretary of state, uh, a guy by the name of Jonathan Weinberger, uh, wrote an article that we read uh, entitled uh, uh, Defining Terrorism. Sure. And, uh, and it's a very fascinating article, but also a kind of frustrating article because he goes through a series of proposed definitions, not that he himself proposes, but that have been proposed by others, uh, uh, definitions of terrorism, and, uh, uh, and systematically shows why they're inadequate. And, uh, uh, and he does that in the larger context of an article that begins with a call for a universal definition of terrorism, a call that I initially found to be quite problematic, but then in the discussion with the students, and this is one of the really great things about working with students at Mary Washington, uh, we collectively, uh, uh, and you know, I can't take the credit for this idea because it came out of the class in the discussions themselves, we collectively came to the realization that his call for a universal definition of terrorism, uh, uh, though perhaps idealistic on the one hand yeah. is something that you would expect from somebody who's working within the State Department because the call for a universal definition of terrorism is a call for diplomacy to sit down and agree uh, 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 yeah. uh, on terms that then uh, uh, lay the foundation for what is acceptable international behavior and what is unacceptable international behavior. Sure. You know, what constitutes international crime, what uh, doesn't constitute in international crime. And I think that, you know, in that regard, our, our sense of Weinberger may have been uh, um, that he's uh, uh, unwilling to commit himself 
uh, uh, to something at the beginning, but by the end of our discussions, all of us, including myself, ha uh, had really kind of changed in our opinions. Um, uh, today we read an article on globalization and, uh, uh, and uh, terrorism after having read two plays this week, one just simply called uh, Terrorism by uh, uh, two Russian uh, brothers uh, 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 who are playwrights, not individually, but they write collectively. They, sure. It's a collaborative endeavor. They're called the uh, Preslikov brothers. And they wrote a play uh, called uh, Terrorism that really has very little to do with terrorism. Uh, uh, per se, uh, um, but in fact actually has much to do with terrorism. There's no act of terrorism in there, but there's deep anxiety that is traceable throughout the, uh, uh, throughout the play itself about potential terrorist acts. The point of departure is uh, an airport that uh, uh, has come to a standstill because their empty bags have been found. <laughs> there, and, uh, uh, and, and they're being checked as bombs. That's awesome. uh, um, they're not, you know, they're not bombs. But uh, 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 but nonetheless, uh, uh, you know, people are terrified. And on the ground, something we all can uh, relate right. to immediately. Uh, uh, a s small child has a, uh, one of these laser pointers, uh, uh, and uh, uh, and he's at a playground with his grandmother, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, the grandmother is with a friend of hers, and uh, uh, and the little boy at one point points the laser pointer at uh, at his grandmother's friend, you know, and uh, uh, and immediately there is a sense of panic. That they're being targeted by a sniper, right? Yeah. And uh, uh, and we know this is you know this is true. If you point one of those things uh, uh, at uh, at the cockpit of an airplane, uh, uh, it's you know <laughs> it's a felony, right? Yeah. Exactly. You know, uh, and uh, so I mean we understand that type of anxiety, but that's a, that's an anxiety that's the direct consequence of terrorist activities. Um, and what I'd say just about this course, and especially for somebody like you, Jim, I mean, that what makes the course interesting. Uh, uh, with regard to the article that we read today by uh, uh, a woman by the name of uh, uh, Audrey Cronin, uh, who talks about globalization, the processes of globalization, and how that's helped facilitate terrorist activity on a global scale. <laughs> uh, uh, towards the end of the article, uh, um, she talks about the United States' uh, uh, incredibly effective ability to, um, to combat uh, uh, its adversaries terrorist activities at a military level, but how, uh, um, how far behind we are in terms of some sense of diplomacy on how to, you know, how to deal uh, uh, at some sort of cultural political level uh, um, uh, uh, with the context uh, of terrorism. And, and uh, towards the end of her article, she says we need to use the processes of globalization, you know, to combat uh, uh, terrorism. I mean, I find that what to be as a well. You know, that's actually that? that's 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 what I was going to drive it, and why I said it's interesting yeah. for you in particular. Like, is it the uh, internet? The idea that we're well. That's a, okay. So that's questions. you know, you know, I look at that statement and I go, wait a minute. The processes of globalization are part of the problem, yeah, exactly. right? You know, and uh, <laughs> and uh, and and then I thought, okay, so you know. I mean, clearly she understands that because of other comments that she's made during her article. I mean, she understands what globalization is sure. and the impact that it has and the problems that it uh, uh, creates at some sort of economic level and, and also political level. Um, but I think what she's talking about are, you know, things like the advanced global technologies that exist now. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and, and, you know, what I realized today towards the end of class, uh, uh, since, uh, uh, since we're using this blog, as the foundation for the course, that in fact what we're doing is uh, uh, is exactly what she is saying needs to be done. Well, I mean, I have two sections of the course. Each has each section has 15 students in it. It's 30 students, uh, uh, and uh, and those 30 students uh, are using you know uh, internet technologies uh, um, to educate themselves about. Uh, terrorism as a phenomena, uh, uh, the the history of 9/11, and it's actually important to understand this as as history because they were um, they were eight years old when yeah. these events went down. So uh, uh, they have they have more recollection of it, of course, than my 14-year-old does. But nonetheless, you know, it's something that seems to be in the distant past to them. At the same time that they recognize that those that event has defined their uh, uh, their life so far, Absolutely. right? And uh, uh, and to see them involved in 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 the processes, we'll say the positive processes of globalization, sure. uh, um, uh, um, as a way to educate themselves and others about uh, about these events, is is something that I think is you know really quite wonderful. And what's interesting that you say in this idea of like the different vision of a globalization of the mechanisms of.
I mean, we look at the Arab Spring and we look at what happened in that region after we have kind of, you know, pulled out to some degree of Iraq and trying to deal with where we are in Afghanistan. But you think about all these nations and all these people in these nations trying to kind of self-identify and take back this idea of who they are. And a lot of that's been attributed, though I think that's a dangerous thing to do completely, to social media, to these new tools of globalization to communicate back uh, to the Western world and beyond that, you know, we're independent nations. You know, this is not about the kind of effort to kind of redefine this part of the world. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that has something to do with how can you ignore diplomacy on almost on now the individual level when you start dealing with social media? I mean, well, I mean, if we think about historical consciousness, right, and, and raising, you know, historical consciousness, I mean, consciousness uh, uh, is, the, uh, is the product of knowledge and, uh, uh, and, and the social media you know, creates awareness of what the events are. I yeah. mean, in the Arab Spring, I mean, you know, we were laughing about tweets uh, yeah. uh, before this. That's right. I mean, uh, uh, tweets informed people that something was happening in a particular square, and people showed up, right? You know, and uh, uh, and and I think in that regard, you know, you look at it and you can say, okay, so what do we know about somebody like Osama bin Laden? I mean, one of the yeah. things that we know is that he was media savvy. Right and uh, and uh, and understood the impact of uh, uh, of all sorts of social medias, uh, uh, and I think you know what we what we need to do in response is to say you know there are other ways, constructive ways to use these media, yeah. uh, this media, and uh, and I think you see it in the Arab Spring. I think that's a, you know that's the, the the clear example, and uh, and it's also the example that I was thinking of when I was thinking about what my students are doing. Uh -uh. But you, you know. also have these unbelievable kind of now archives of, you know, state-sponsored terrorism against these protesters. I mean, yeah. think about Syria. Jo I mean, go back, and I'm not saying just in the Middle East, but even in any country, even here in the U.S., right, you have now this way of capturing, you know, state-sponsored terrorism, and that really does complicate this notion of terrorism, that universal definition, right? Yeah, Is that, absolutely. like, we have this historical consciousness now, but it also has an archival digital memory. Right. And so I wonder if that might mean something, this idea of globalization that she's talking about, for us kind of rethinking a post 9-11 world in which, you know, that was a traumatic event, particularly for the U.S. and for what it meant for us. But, you know, does it also kind of, for many, start a different moment of historical consciousness? I mean, that's a very, really interesting question. It's a, uh, it decentralizes it, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, 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 decentralizes the uh, uh, dissemination of information. And, uh, uh, and, I mean, you know, the way that dictators stay in power, of course, is, you know, keeping people un uninformed uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and uninformed about their use of uh, brutality, except as some sort of looming threat. But, you know, uh, but when we see, you know, when we see the brutality, when we see the events, uh, um, uh, 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 we're as enraged as we are, you know, potentially intimidated. And, uh, uh, and I think that that's the real value of, the, uh, of that archival function uh, um, is that, you know, it begins to, you know, expose uh, uh, the leaders who would prefer to, uh, um, to work in secret at some level, sure. right? Secret in terms of their relation to the world at large. And, uh, uh, and I think that, you know, that exerts a certain amount of pressure. Well, that was what's so interesting. And I do want to get a list of some of the books you're reading for our viewers. But one of the quick things is if you think about what happened in Iran during the election mm -hmm. and the way in which, you know, they cut out all media and tried to even turn off the Internet, right? right. I mean, but you still had this sense of a reporting of what was happening there. But what was interesting to me is with no centralized idea, you had no idea who was reporting what. And there was this whole thing about there's a dummy reporting going on by mm -hmm. someone or someone that's not really who they seem to be right. or people saying here's how you make a Molotov cocktail or mm -hmm. burn tires. And there was Twitter just became this kind of, you know, completely decentered space reporting the event. And it was almost as scary as the centralized CNN or whatever you want to say, like, yeah. you know, reportage of it. So it's interesting how, you know, we're in this place that has been these extreme moves from one place to the other, but also after 9-11 or right around 9-11 is when the kind of idea of the blog took hold mm -hmm. and people started to use it to express themselves, to find people, to share that experience. So it's funny how so much of our moment now is also defined by that post 9-11 um, moment in the technology, and that mm -hmm. goes for people who are against the war. I mean, there was all sorts of voices out there, mm -hmm. and they also didn't feel that uh, mass media really reflected how they felt yeah. or what they were saying. So.
I mean, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think that you know one of the interesting things for me to uh, uh, um, to consider along these lines is uh, uh, is the relation of that mass media uh, um, to um, the actual practice of theater. Um, when you know you were talking about or kind of implicitly asking about the uh, material that we're reading in the class sure. uh, um, and some of the books. I mean, you know, the two books that we read this week, the two plays that we read was the one by the Preslikov brothers, uh, Terrorism. Uh, um, we also read by uh, a play by uh, uh, Robin Sones that's a, a, what's called a docudrama. It's based on interviews. So you have, you know, real words from real people uh, um, uh, recited by, uh, uh, by real actors, gotcha. right? And, uh, uh, and it's done primarily in an interview format. So it's not, you know, in terms of staging and stuff like that, it's not a particularly dynamic uh, uh, piece of theater, but the stories that are told are unbelievably compelling narratives about uh, uh, a wide variety of, uh, uh, of um, uh, terrorist activity uh, um, uh, told by, you know, terrorists, former terrorists, essentially, sure. right, and, uh, uh, and uh, who were interviewed for, uh, for the piece. And, um, and, you know, one of the things that you see is uh, uh, um, interviews uh, uh, from, uh, from terrorists who uh, were conscripts uh, uh, from a very early age, right? I mean, and we're talking about when they were adolescents. And, uh, uh, and, uh, 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 and you know, as part of the Ugandan civil war, for example, sure. and uh, uh, and uh, and and suddenly you begin to realize that you know that uh, that there is an incredible lack of opportunity for these individuals, that uh, that that they're taken hold of uh, at at moments where they're partic particularly uh, uh, susceptible to you know ideological indoctrination and manipulation. And, uh, and part of the argument that comes out of that is that you know, when we talk about acts of terror, two things you know, seem to be uh, uh, um, uh, undeniably the case. Uh, the first thing is that the, is that the actual physical casualties uh, um, uh, of uh, an act of terror are not the targets. It's the survivors uh, uh, who, who are supposed to be uh, uh, intimidated and, and, uh, uh, and should be afraid as a consequence of these events. That's how terrorism works, yeah. right? Uh, uh, I mean, occasionally you have acts of terror that target specific uh, uh, prominent individuals, right? I mean, right at the beginning of the First World War, uh, 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 the assassination of the Archduke. I mean, you know, this is an act of terrorism by an anarchist, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, um, but nonetheless, you know, it was a very clear targeted uh, 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 assassination. And it provoked, you know, a, a, a horrific war. That's right. right. Uh, um, the second thing uh, that uh, that I think that you have to keep in mind is not just that the uh, um, that the the uh, the people who are the survivors who become aware of those who are the casualties, you know, are the intended audience for acts of terror, but the people who perpetrate the actual acts, at some level are really only pawns of other people, right, uh, who've indoctrinated them. That's also true of the 9-11 the terrorists, right? Uh, um, I mean, we, we uh, uh, think of, you know, uh, those who commandeered the aircrafts as, as, you know, those were the terrorists. At, at some level, I think, the, you know, the much more profound awareness of terrorism as a phenomena is, that, is the realization that those were individuals who were indoctrinated and manipulated by somebody else. And, uh, uh, and, you know, we call them the masterminds, but, I mean, I, I think, you know, that, that says something uh, uh, about those individuals that, that I don't find particularly uh, constructive. I mean, I, it's, I mean, when I'm trying to understand terror, I mean, uh, what, uh, or terrorism as a phenomena, uh, um, I mean, what I would say is that, that, you know, we have to address situations where the most extreme voices suddenly get a hearing. Yeah. I mean, in the United States, I mean, we have, you know, we have unbelievable social problems, but we have not reached the point now where the most extreme voices uh, uh, are really getting uh, the kind of hearing uh, uh, that would lead to, you know, horrific acts, you know, all over the place where people are using bombs and stuff like that. I mean, we do have, you know, we do have homegrown terrorism, clearly, sure. but, yeah. but, uh, but not on the scale that I'm talking about. Right? Wow. Yeah. Well, James, that's awesome. What was the name of that book again, that play? That one that you were just talking about. Uh, talking to terrorists. Talking to terrorists. And it Fine. begins with uh, it's uh, uh, well, it's uh, it's kind of a collective uh, uh, um, 
piece, but the uh, but the person whose name is uh, listed as the uh, uh, the playwright is uh, Robin Sones. Robin Sones. Yeah, that's awesome. So. Well, James, thanks for coming here today and yeah. talking with us about 9/11. Thank you. Appreciate yeah, it. I appreciate it. Take thanks. care. Okay. DTLT today. Thanks for soon, uh, tuning in. You can wave goodbye to the audience. Bye bye. bye. <laughs>